Uh, so I'm going to be talking about human fathers, but I'm going to be doing it in the context of what we're calling the evolved human eco economy and an ecological model. And I'd like to recognize my co-authors in this talk, uh, Paul Hooper, John Stieglitz, and Mike Gervin, and our funding sponsors, the National Institute of, on Aging. We'll be arguing that there are three principal economic relations in foraging societies, and that this is a modal pattern, meaning that most groups show it, but not all groups. So the three principles are kin-based altruism with downward intergenerational transfers, that is, from grandparents to parents, from parents to children, and grandparents to grandchildren. That reciprocity is another economic relation based upon reducing risk of variance in day-to-day -day diet and in joint resource production, cooperative foraging. And that there's complementarity and specialization among the sexes in reproduction, household, and resource production. Here's a figure that's meant to diagram three generations of families. So this is the grandparental generation. This is family one of the first generation, family one of the second generation, of the third, and the different families. And these arrows are meant to characterize resource flows. And we are discussing the three types of relationships. So between husbands and wives, there's joint production of offspring and the household economy. And then there are downward flows with kin altruism, so the thicker arrows. There's flows in both directions of food going downward and upward. And there's also downward flows and upward flows across two generations, but always thicker going downward than upward. That is, more going downward than going upward. And these relationships are meant to characterize reciprocity. I give you today, you give me tomorrow, or we share in the products of our labor. I think that this uh, economy evolved in relation, these relations evolved in, in response to a specialized foraging niche, that humans eat high quality, calorically dense plant and animal foods, that it's a learning intensive foraging strategy, skill intensive, that there are late age peak in caloric production, and that there's gains to cooperation in production and risk reduction, and that there's high complementarity between the male and female inputs into production and reproduction. And so this gives you a feeling of what I'm talking about in terms of the kind of a diet that humans uh, eat. So this is comparing humans to chimpanzees, our closest living relative, of uh, the three types of resources that you can eat, collected foods like leaves and fruits that are just picked off of the, the plant, extracted gathered fruits, plant foods that are like nuts and tubers that require digging or processing to get to, and hunted foods. And what we can see is, is that chimpanzees and humans are omnivores. They all eat the three types of foods, but chimpanzees are primarily eating leaves and fruits. Humans eat very almost no leaves and very little fruit, much more extracted foods, and a much greater hunted proportion of the diet. And what we're arguing is, is that as you move across these three categories, they're getting more difficult to acquire, more skill intensive, more nutritional value to the foods, and bigger package sizes. But these biggest package sizes also create variance and create needs for sharing. So in looking at uh, how this diet links to the rest of the life history, we see some striking features of the human demography compared to chimps. So this is a curve that looks at the years of life that remain to you as a given a function of your age. So if you look at it at age zero, it's life expectancy at birth. Foragers happen to have a life expectancy on average of about 35 years. Chimpanzees at birth have about a 13 to 15 year. Well, what I want you to see here is, is that at, w at the age at which reproduction begins, chimpanzees have about 15 more years of life, 
whereas humans have an extra 40 years of life, so that would bring them up to 55. And if they make it to the age at which reproduction ceases, on average, people have an extra 22 years or, of life or so remaining. And what you can see here is how particular the human stamp is. All the groups are lying on top of one another compared to the chimpanzees. And we've even put in Sweden in the 18th century here, and they fall right in the middle of the hunter-gatherers and the forager horticulturalists, suggesting that this long lifespan is a characteristic feature of our species. And it turns out that if you take the density of deaths and you say, for all adults, how many deaths occur at this age, at this age, at this age? And we see a peak density of deaths occurring right at about age 70 in the traditional groups. It's moved over to the late 80s in modern society. But it's, it is interesting when we think about a 35-year life expectancy that the highest density of adult deaths is still at age 70. And that's because most of that early death is infancy, and so that lowers life expectancy. Now, this is a, uh, a graph of age-specific caloric production and caloric production. So these, these two graphs here, they're, they're, on my computer, they're dashed, are the consumption by age. So by age 18, you're in the 2,000 calorie range. This is males and this is females. And these lines are their production. This is for the Tsimane, but we've seen very similar curves for the Ache, the Hiwi, the Kung, the Hansa, the Machigenga, and Piero. What's most variable is the female production curve. But what you can see is that there's a big caloric deficit in early ages and a caloric surplus in older ages. And if you net them out, this is what it looks like in net. So you're getting more expensive as you're growing. And then you cross over at around age 20, and then you're a net producer the rest of your life. Now, in terms of looking at the complementarity between the male and the female inputs in the human case, we have a primate commitment to carrying infants in intensive maternal care. We heard a lot about that already. And there's an incompatibility of care and hunting because it's very dangerous to be chasing live animals. And the protein and fat in game complement carbohydrate-rich plant foods. And so what we end up seeing is specialization and alternative skill trajectories of men and women. And uh, what the females give in the way of childcare and gathered products complements what the males are giving in the way of hunted protein and fat products. So what we're talking about in terms of the skill intensiveness of the human foraging niche it can be seen in, in this graph that was done by Rob Walker, Kim Hill, and myself in which we looked at physical strength plotted on this graph by age. And as you could see, men are reaching their peak strength in their early 20s. And then this is their hunting return rate. That is the amount of calories of meat that they get for every hour they spend. And at age 20, their poultry, 25% as good as they're going to be when they're in middle age. What I did was to try to think about this as a contrary to fact experiment, a thought experiment. I asked, well, why don't women hunt and why don't men gather? Well, what would, they, what would happen if women hunted? If we make the assumption that women can't hunt when they're really pregnant and they're lactating a young baby, but when they're not really pregnant and they're not lactating, they could hunt. How much practice would they get? And how, would, how much would they get if they compare that to, to gathering? So this is, the, this is taking the ache and doing the, this is the real for women, and this is the Hypothetical, if they hunted, this is the real for men, and this is the hypothetical for gathering. And this is the cumulative calories net after consuming all of their own caloric needs that they would produce over life. 
And because the Ache women are spending so much of their time in childcare, they're actually not producing enough to feed themselves, so they're becoming increasingly costly uh, calorically as they age, but less so by gathering. And ironically, for the men, it goes the other direction. And this is because when you do learn how to hunt, and after a while, you can get very good at it. So when we sum all of this up, and we look at the percent food contributions, so this is taking the 10 societies for which we can quantify the daily caloric production of individuals. And uh, in 2001, uh, we calculated that on average, and there's quite a bit of variability across foraging societies, men are acquiring about two-thirds of, of the calories and most of the protein. But when you sum out what the women are eating for themselves, almost all of the food energy, extra food energy, is being produced by the men. Now, as I pointed out in the bottom of that other figure, is that women are spending a huge amount of time in childcare. And here is data from the Tsimane, in which we're looking at who's, who are the different caretakers of the kids. And moms are doing the, the bulk of the caretaking in the Tsimane. I think this is pretty cross-culturally variable how much other owl parents help. But there's no question that it's mom who's doing the bulk of it. And then when you add the fact that women are helping with the food processing. They're, the men and the women are each contributing different ne necessary components of the reproductive and the productive economy. And as a result, it looks like uh, polygyny is relatively uncommon in foraging societies, that in almost 50% of the societies, less than 5% of marriages are polygynous, but if you sum this all up, most of the marriages in hunter-gatherer societies are monogamous. Now, this is a figure that we've put together that takes regression models and looks at who, who shared with who as a function of uh, their, their age and their relationship to one another. So this, this actually measures, in the Tumane, the food flows going up and going down. As you can see, they're going in both directions. This side nets it all out so that you can see it more clearly. And what I want you to get out of this figure is, is that almost all of the net arrows are going downward across the generations. And the one exception is one arrow going from adult men to their uh, in-laws, but that then is being got, brought down to the in-laws' kids. And so in, in, on net, it's still a downward process. And we're seeing the flows going from men to women, men to women, uh, in, in the same generation. And this is not to say that men are more productive than women. It's to say that they are helping women do the other tasks in life by providing the net calories. Now, another thing that we found is that while it's true that men can continue to reproduce into old age, most men don't. In fact, most men have effective behavioral menopause because they, when their wife goes through menopause, they don't have any more kids. This is for the Tsimane. So 90% of men did not reproduce after, again after their wife went through menopause. Some, those who did, were polygynously married. There were a few who did it for other reasons as well. And we found a very similar pattern for Aceh foragers, where about 80-some-odd percent didn't reproduce again after their wife went through menopause. Now, this graph looks at, for the Tsumane, 
the flows from mom to children, from dad to children, from grandma to grandchildren, from grandpa to grandchildren, and from husband to wife. And the biggest flows, as we saw from the other figure, are from father, which is peaking out at around 3,000 calories to his children per day. And it's dropping as they're getting older. And, and then he starts to pick up and starts to give to grandchildren the dotted blue line and has a peak in, in the 60s and then drops down again. Here is the women with the same similar age peak, just lower and a similar age peak for the grandchildren in the food transfers. What you can see here is that at about age 70 is when people no longer have net transfers downward. This is when they're reaching the age at which they can just basically produce what they can consume through aging. And here's a way of looking at how these two things may be linked together. So here are the expected number of descendants based upon a normal family growth pattern uh, for hunter-gatherers that you'd have a, your peak number of dependent kids in your 30s, and then your peak number of dependent grandchildren are going to be in your 60s. And what we're seeing here is, is that it's just as this is going down, we're really seeing the, this is the mortality curve, the risk of instantaneous risk of mortality. And it stays really quite low until about age 60, and that's where we see the really big acceleration. So to conclude, I would say that uh, humans have a unique species typical economy that's based on an ecological niche characterized by a learning intensive food acquisition strategy, uh, a life history strategy of high parental investment, high rates of juvenile and adult survival and a long lifespan, and that the economy is organized by three principles, kin-based altruism in downward intergenerational transfers, reciprocity and cooperative production among unrelated individuals, and complementarity and specialization by sex in joint production and re reproduction. And that men, as fathers and grandfathers, acquire energy to support wives, children, and grandchildren, while women engage in a mix of energy production, processing, and childcare. And that most marriages are monogamous among foragers, and it appears as if most men cease to reproduce when their wives reach menopause. And lastly, I've been talking in very broad strokes here, generalizing among foraging groups based upon data. But there is a great deal of variation, especially when you look at the full breadth of the ethnographic literature. And I would offer the suggestion that variations away from this modal pattern are going to be due to differences in age profiles of production. So when children are more productive, there'll be less downward flows. There are going to be factors that would affect how much men can really make a difference to women uh, and their children. And that's going to cause ecological variation. And again, the gains from cooperation are going to vary from place to place.